Hi, welcome to a new week of The Bridge Connection. Hope you had a great weekend uh, fellowshipping with other believers, whether you were able to do it on, at, at your church or, or not, or maybe you were in smaller groups or maybe just over the internet, but keep your eyes focused on Jesus for these times. And uh, there'll be a day when we're all back together again. In fact, it's gonna be a day when we're all together again. And man, I am looking forward to that. We are in the uh, Gospel of Mark. We've been going through it on, on the Monday through Friday, been going through it verse by verse. And we've gone down through verse 13 of chapter six. So if you want to turn there. Um, now, what's happened is the, the miracles and the teaching of Jesus. And now Jesus has just sent his disciples out uh, to preach the gospel. And, and uh, we're gonna see what happened then. It was, it was incredible, but in the meantime, they're out and they're healing people and, and, and talking about Jesus and causing people, asking people to repent. And Herod heard about Jesus and heard about things that were being said about, heard about what he was doing. And this highly troubled Herod, uh, causing him some spiritual conviction, probably. And the reason for that is contained in the passage we're gonna read beginning with verse 14 here, a passage that, that pictures the this, this whole section is the immoral versus the righteous. Pick it up, verse 14. Now, King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known, and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it's Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet, or, or like one of the prophets. So uh, Herod's trying to figure out who these is, who, 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 who Jesus is, the, the miracles uh, and the teachings of Jesus, and now the disciples uh, brought him to Herod's attention, but Herod was uncomfortable at what he heard about Jesus. And these verses prefigure the central event of Mark's gospel, and that's the confession of Peter in chapter eight, verse 27. We'll get there in a couple chapters. It's the, the, the central theme of the event of, of this gospel. But some people thought at this time that Jesus was John the Baptist, raised from the dead, and he was granting Jesus the power to perform miracles. This notion may have also arisen from the fact that Jesus' message and um, the disciples' message were a continuation of John's message of the need for repentance. So you can see where this could maybe, you know, have, have uh, started to be interpreted as truth. Elijah is mentioned in Malachi 4, 5 as returning before the day of the Lord. So the Jews understood this, that as the day of the Lord, when God would conquer Israel's enemies and bring peace and prosperity to their land, the Messiah was the one who would lead this, this restoration of Israel. Um, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. Israel had not had an important prophet in more than 300 years. But they were looking for prophets from God who would speak authoritatively for God like the prophets did. Those prophets called for repentance and announced God's judgment on, on those who turned away. Could it be that Jesus was one of their line, that he was one of them? Pick it up at verse 16. But when Herod heard, he said, I know who this is. This is John, who might be hidden. He has been raised from the dead. So he, Herod thought he knew exactly who Jesus was. John the Baptist raised from the dead. You know, a guilty conscience can uh, be a terrible thing. Uh, you have a guilty conscience, it can make you look suspicious, suspiciously at everybody and everything. Uh, the belief that everybody knows permeates every thought creating anxiety and worry. Such was the condition of King Herod. Pick up verse 16. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John, whom I beheaded. He's been raised from the dead. Then verse 17, for Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother's, brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Well, here's, here's what had happened. John the Baptist, uh, uh, this, uh, 
death that, that, that we start just start reading about John's death at the hands of, of Herod. And according to Jewish historian Josephus, John the Baptist was imprisoned in a place called Macarus, a Roman fortress overlooking the, the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. It's a very bleak, grim, ugly place. The dungeons are still there today. Herod had imprisoned John because John had rebuked him for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife. While Jewish law required that a man marry his brother's wife if the brother died in order to carry on the brother's line, no such event had taken place. Philip, Herod's brother, was still living. Therefore, Herod was in violation of Levitical law. It's in uh, Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. Pick it up. Mark chapter 6, we'll pick it up at verse 18. Because John had said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So John had showed tremendous courage by rebuking Herod publicly. Herod was a powerful Roman ruler who could have John executed whenever he pleased just by speaking the word. But John didn't pull any punches. Verse 19, therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many, when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So you have quite a contrast here, I think, you know, be, be, between these two, uh, Herod and Herodias. Herodias hated John, wanted to put him to death immediately. Anyway, let's do it. Herod, on the other hand, recognized John as a righteous man. He spoke the truth. Apparently, Herod even liked listening to him. So he refused to have him executed. Unfortunately, he didn't allow his respect for John to blossom into repentance and re receive the truth that John was saying. Verse 21, then an opportune day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. So Herod threw himself a birthday party, and Herodias, since she harbored such great hatred in her heart for John the Baptist, she waited for an opportune moment to move against him. You know, I've noticed that sinners oftentimes have great patience in waiting, watching, planning for just the right moment to do something that it would be horrendous. Herod's birthday banquet gave her the opportunity she had been waiting for. Verse 22. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. And he also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give it. I will give you up to half of my kingdom. Wow, we have quite a quite an event beginning to happen here in this situation. The daughter of Herodias is listed by Josephus, the Jewish historian as Salome, or Salome, that would be the way you want to pronounce it. The word translated girl means a, a young girl of manageable, marriageable age. She, she was probably a teenager. Her dance was a suggestive, indecent dance meant to incite the lust of Herod and his guest. Whether or not this dance was instigated by Herodias, her mom, I don't know. She knew it was taking place. Herodias' hatred of John the Baptist led her to prostitute her own daughter in an effort to gain John's death. Well, Herod was pleased with Salome's performance and he vowed to give her whatever she wanted. Scholars generally agree that his promise to give her up to Half of his kingdom was just a, a, a statement. It was, it was meant to show his, his greatness and generosity to those leaders who were attending the party. He wasn't planning on giving that much by any means. Verse 24, so she went out to ask her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head 
of John the Baptist on the platter. Well, when Herodias got her opportunity, she told her daughter to ask for John's death. Well, her daughter added two further requests to that of her mother. She wanted John's death to take place at once, and she wanted his head on a platter. Her cruelty just had to be a mirror of her mother's. Verse 26, And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the, the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. In this situation, Herod stood in pathetic contrast to Jesus. Jesus never played to the crowds. Herod, however, could not deny the girl's request no matter how much it went against his wishes. He had taken a rash oath. <laughs> right in front of, of his guests, so he granted her wish. Hendrickson says in his commentary that Herod probably could have escaped the vow that he made. He could have simply said, I promised you a gift, not a crime. He could have repented as John had urged him to. Instead, he sinned against God as well as his better judgment. So the request was granted and the bloody gift was handed to Salome and eventually to Herodias. Look at verse 29. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and they laid it in a tomb. So John's disciples came and uh, they gave him the, the burial he deserved and they reported this event to Jesus. You can read that in Matthew chapter, chapter 14. And most of them probably, just speculation, but probably joined Jesus' ministry. John certainly would have approved this move. About 30 years later, during Paul's ministry, there were still some people who knew nothing about Jesus. Under the counsel of Paul, these followers became followers of Jesus. They only knew about the baptism of John. Great story. Read about it in Acts chapter 19. Just the first part of the chapter there, first six, seven verses, something like that. It's a great story. I love it. Verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Now, the disciples returned. We had that, that thing in the, set, in, in the middle of him sending the disciples out and them coming back. The disciples returned from their mission and, and they reported it to Jesus. They reported two things, what they had done and what they had taught. How they had lived and what they had taught were, were both of, of vital interest to Christ. He'd given them precise instructions in both areas. This report revealed their obedience to him. The degree of, and commitment of, of effectiveness of each, each one of the disciples. Jesus needed to know for the salvation of the world depended on their lives and, and their teaching. He was soon to leave everything in their hands and he wanted to make sure they were obedient and they were getting it and they would be faithful. We as believers are, are accountable for both how we live and what we teach. We are to be obedient to Jesus Christ, living exactly as he has said and teaching exactly what he has said to teach. Every single disciple is held accountable to God. Every one of us. Read it Hebrews 13, 17 later on your own. We're accountable to God. We should live and teach so that we can share anything with the Lord. We should have nothing to hide or of nothing to be ashamed. We should be able to come to him and, and share openly everything in our hearts, in our lives. Then the apostles, verse 30, gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a desert place 
and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Rest, devotion. You know, when you're doing things for God, the very first danger is not taking time to rest. The disciples were extremely tired. They had gone forth as the Lord had carried out his mission and it had exhausted them. Since returning, the demanding crowds surrounding Jesus were pressing in upon them. They barely had time to make their reports to Jesus, much less rest and meditate. Therefore suggested, Jesus suggested, they go apart into a desert place and, and get alone with God. Get alone with the Father for a while. Notice several things. First of all, it was both the work of the ministry and the demands, demands of the crowd that attacks the disciples' energy. It's not work alone that tires the body. Responsibility, the weight of it, creates pressure and, and taxes people's energy. Just the presence of a demanding crowd is a reminder that we are responsible to whatever God has called us to do when he puts us in any position. In any, not just a position, but a place to be able to open our mouths. Secondly, the disciples had bodies that naturally required, naturally required some relief from pressure and rest from labor. Psalm 55, 6 and 7 says, And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and not be at rest, and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I love that. Were there times I feel like that? The disciples had spirits that required some extended periods alone with God in meditation, study, in prayer. They had to receive from God in order to share the presence and message of God. They had to be still and listen, giving God opportunity to share with them in their hearts. They had to be recharged before they could charge. They had to have, have the relationship and the, 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 the currentness of the relationship. The disciples needed a quiet, deserted place to get alone with God. Not a place where others were. Not a place of business, of, of business or commercialism, of you know, nice accommodations. You know, the, the Lord cared about them. He cared about their exhaustion. They had poured themselves into his mission and into, into the lives of people. He knew they needed rest and rekindling and refuge and consoling. They needed relaxation and worship. So he had compassion on them. So he said, come apart and rest a while. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 33. But the multitudes saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. The second danger is <laughs> taking too much time to rest. People are desperately seeking help. We should take the time we need and only the time we need to rest our body and our spirit. No more, no less. This scene was dramatic. The people saw where Jesus and the disciples were, were heading. They began to, began to run by, by foot around the lake. And as they ran, they, they passed through the city shouting excitedly the news that Jesus was nearby. So throngs of people joined in the streaming mass of humanity making its way around the, around the lake. Must have been an incredible sight. And by the time they reached the place where Jesus' ship was to dock, the crowd had grown, you know what it is, to 5,000 men, not counting women and children. 10, 15, 20,000 people, I don't know. This is the crucial point. The disciples needed rest. They knew it, Jesus knew it, yet there was a demanding crowd. They were interfering and keeping the disciples from their much needed rest. The disciples became irritated and soon one of the people sent away. 
You can see that by the request and verse 36, we'll get there in a minute and, and how they ask a question in verse 37, we'll see that. However, Jesus knew something. The disciples had rested some coming across the lake. The sea, their old stomping ground, had relaxed them a great deal and they just, they didn't even know it. And that was sufficient to carry the disciples through another session of ministry. It was a matter of just how exhausted the human body really was versus the needs of the people. And in this particular case, the disciples were ready to act selfishly and take too much rest, thereby neglecting the people. There's a time to minister. Just as there is a time to spend alone with God. There's a time to work just as there is a time to pray. There's a time, time to get up and to get to it just as there's a time to rest and, and relax. You know, and I, I'm thinking that through this pandemic and we have more alone time than we've ever had, are we seizing it? Are you seizing it for times with God? Just rest me during this time, Lord. Rest me in your word. Rest me in my spirit. Rest me in your presence as I worship and praise and give you thanks. Unfortunately, many have the problems of resting and relaxing too much instead of working too much. Oh, careful, Jeff, but some even spend too much time in what they call Bible study, prayer, and fellowship with God and neglect being out amongst the people enough. It's not true during this pandemic, but I see it. I've seen it all my, all my life. All on this earth, fellowship with God is primarily to prepare us to go out and make him real to others, to minister to others who have need, the need of knowing Jesus. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night comes when no man can work. John 9, 4, Acts 4, 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And unless we're seeing those things, hearing those things, we have nothing to speak. And when we hear and see those, we need to speak those things. Verse 34, we gotta finish this chapter. If I speed up just a little tiny bit. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. <laughs> the third danger, the third danger I think is losing sight of people who are as sheep without a shepherd. Again, the scene is descriptive. As the boat approached the shore, Jesus stood in the boat watching the multitude, clamoring for space on the seashore. He needed rest. His disciples needed rest even more. But Jesus was not annoyed or irritated with the people. Contrarywise, he was moved with deep, intense compassion because the people were his sheep without a shepherd. And he couldn't turn them away despite the need for rest. He could do only one thing. He had to meet their need. He had to teach them. So he began to teach them many things. Notice when he says, they were as sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. And just looking at, 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 at sheep, the, the real sheep. They have a shepherd, don't have a shepherd, they're bewildered and they wander off, they don't know what to do. Not knowing where they're going or where they're supposed to be. They get lost ever so easily. They can't find their way back to the flock. Once they, 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 they wander off, they can't find their way back. So it is with people. People without the shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, are bewildered. They don't know where they have come from or where they're going or why they're there. <laughs> They wander about getting lost in place after place, never finding the way to true life because they never surrender to the shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd go hungry. They don't have adequate nourishment. 
they can't find sufficient food to live. They try to find food and they, they, they'll starve to death, a sheep will. So it is with people. People without the shepherd, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, go hungry. They don't have the shepherd of God to feed and inspire their souls or to satisfy their inner longings for peace, love, joy, peace, all of the, the, the fruit of the, of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. They have only themselves to depend upon as they seek to meet the craving for life. They have only themselves in seeking to find the answers to what's my purpose here? Why am I here? What, what's my direction? Which way do I go? How do I have assurance of what happens? What do I do with my loneliness? I, I don't want to be lonely. I feel this emptiness. How do I take care of this emptiness? I'm disturbed most of the time. I'm depressed when I don't see things happening. How do I deal with I get sick. How do I deal with sickness? I watch people die and I know I'm going to die one day. I don't know what to do. with. If we don't have the shepherd teaching us those things, we will never know what to do. And Jesus said to them in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes in me shall never thirst. He also said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which, will, which I will give for the life of the world. It's in John six fifty one. And the third thing, what happens with sheep without a shepherd? They can't find shelter or safety. Sheep are exposed to all kinds of dangers of the wilderness. So it is with people. People without the shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, are, ex are exposed to all that, that's in the world and they're, they're doomed. They're doomed because of the, the temptations and the trials of the world. Every opportunity to attack them will come, attack and destroy all who wonder about. I said I was going to try to finish this chapter. I'm not. We're just going to quit right there. If you're a believer, make absolutely certain that you're following the shepherd. You're reading his word. You're listening to it being taught at times. You're on your face before him in prayer. You're worshiping him from the depth of your being and you realize that you are saved by faith. That it's by faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you that gives you God's righteousness, that gives you access into eternity, his presence for eternity. And it's simply believing what Jesus did for you and accepting that as payment for every way that you have failed or sinned or done wrong. That's the gospel. And when you take hold of that gospel, you can't help just falling deeper in love with him. You can't help wanting to hear what he says to us here in his word. You can't help wanting to hear his voice. And you can't help wanting to see him one day face to face. Well, we're going to put a comment there, leave it there. We'll pick it up where we left off as we come together tomorrow. Jesus loves you so much, man. Love you back.